series of conversations, and this is just sort of the right form. It's meant to be somewhat small crowd and intimate, so we all have uh, a chance to talk to the artists and, and Dr. Chasen tonight. I remember uh, I organized a tour to murals in Providence. I think you were on it. It was a bus tour for urban studies. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine uh, is not here tonight, uh, Patricia Huntington, no. I think, was on that tour, your sister, obviously, and she said, this is Dr. Chasen, here's an image. And he was in a mural that uh, Augustine Patino had done right in a sort of uh, perpendicular to Broad Street. Amazing mural about Providence's place in the world. It's very poetic. And Dr. Chasen was in it. And that's the first time I really realized uh, what a central figure in the art scene of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, he is, and uh, how many artists he has sponsored, and so I learned a little more, and then we finally met in person, and now this is the result, really, that uh, we can celebrate his new book here. Um, Dr. Chasen was born in Rochester, and went to school in Buffalo, and then uh, went to uh, university, what's now SUNY Buffalo School of Medicine, and then trained in internal medicine and nephrology uh, in Boston hospitals, and then he joined the faculty of Brown, uh, in the Brown School of Medicine, and uh, during that time, and while he served in that role, he developed and initiated the kidney dialysis program at Rhode Island Hospital, and he was promoted to clinical professor of medicine at the Warren Albert Medical School, which is now down the street. At that point, it wasn't yet. We built a, we converted a wonderful building for it uh, in 1991, and it's now an emeritus since 2009. And uh, at the same time, since the 70s, he pursued his uh, personal career, private career of a practice of nephrology and uh, offer, and still do, uh, he and his associates offer dialysis treatment in 10 clinics in Rhode Island. But of course, the reason why he's here is a, is a different one, which is really that uh, he has been involved in uh, community activities here in Rhode Island as a great supporter of the arts in many ways. He has served uh, on the boards of AS220 and the Southside Community Land Trust, and has been a, a, trust, a trustee at RISTI. And the Wheeler School is past chairman of RISCA and past president of Temple Beth L, and a former trustee of the Newport Art Museum, and currently is on the Fine Arts Committee of the Rhode Island School of uh, Design Museum. Dr. Chase and his late wife, Helene, started uh, collecting contemporary art in 1973 eventually do, uh, donating uh, many, many pieces uh, to uh, museums, over 30 museums, uh, including, of course, the Rhode Island Museum. And they had a show about the objects in its uh, collection in 2005 called Chasen's Choice, wonderful uh, title. And so he, in the recent 15 years or so, he has co focused on collecting contemporary work of Rhode Island artists and on highlighting their careers through initiatives such as public art placement, as I said in the beginning, and production of the visual arts and supporting public art pieces. And he also uh, works uh, with um, Rhode Island PPS to document uh, Rhode Island artists through his networks project, Art Rhode Island. And uh, uh, it's really a, a, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chasen. Uh, I found a wonderful quote uh, in, the, uh, in the Newport magazine which said, no one comes close to the impact Dr. Joseph Chasen has made in our little state when it comes to supporting the visual arts in Rhode Island. But I, uh, before I ask you to welcome uh, him, I'll introduce our two other speakers as well because they've worked together on this amazing book that you see sitting here and that we'll have for sale uh, later and we'll hear more about it. And this is Arminio Pinke, who many of you know, of course, his work uh, is an educator, illustrator, fabricator, and of course, artistic director of Big Naso Lab, which has been around for a long time. And you know, I always remember seeing those big figures in the storefronts of Westminster Street, and uh, has made many children and, and grown up thousands of them happy over the uh, years, and uh, has this great creature shop and touring group in Providence. He's a recipient of the Carter Fellowship in 2018 for entrepreneurial innovation. He formed the Space Transformation Station, which is a satellite studio of Big Naso Lab, and that supports a variety of community initiatives and programs uh, in interactive visual and performance arts. He went to RISD and uh, has been an instructor at the RISD Film Department from 1987 to 2020, and illustration as well. And his work is regularly featured 
in the Motif magazine comics page. Finally, Lenny uh, here, Lenny Schwartz, he's a prolific award-winning playwright, born in North Sitchard, Rhode Island, and uh, he has about 25 years of experience as a director and writer, and has written films such as Normal, Long Night in a Dead City, Higher Methods, Accidental Incest, co-directed films such as Comic Book Junkies and Far From Perfect, and written and directed a long list of plays, including Ditko, Buster Keaton, Fate to Blank Lucy, countless others. And his current play is uh, Bill Finger, Rise of the Bat, about the Batman co-creator Bill Finger, and he runs the Daydream Theatre Company and serves as senior chairperson at the Rise uh, Playhouse in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. We are here, of course, to celebrate and introduce to you that uh, common, that joint uh, project, <coughs> Jason, unfiltered, and we'll hear more about it. So please help me welcome Dr. Jason, Lenny Schwartz, and then we can You can have the book. But it's sort of like hearing your eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting close. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I came a year ago and then self-invited to be included. The following year I heard Anu give her great presentation. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly because the book and Erminio and Lenny speak for the exercise. Um, you're only as good as the people who you choose to work with. In my entire career, I think I could uh, say that I was very good at picking people to help me do the work and then take credit for it. Why not? <laughs> so I have commissioned a lot of artwork over the years. And um, several years ago, I don't know how many years ago did we begin this? Four, maybe? Um, whatever. It was supposed to be done when I was 85, but it was not quite. And now I'm 87, so. Anyway, um, I, was, uh, I had dinner with one of my youngest associates at the time, and I was regaling her with my uh, history in nephrology, which I was one, like the second generation of nephrologists and among the first to be able to provide uh, chronic dialysis services, which we offered throughout the state. Because when I came in 1967, there were no services and people died of kidney failure. So, um, the, uh, the point is that in the 70s, I decided uh, to go into the practice of nephrology and open clinics. And subsequently, I uh, commissioned public art, I collected art, whatever. But my youngest associate suggested from the story that I should write a book, which seemed absurd at the time, but she was young and we were having dinner. And I acknowledged that was a good idea. And then the next night, and I do believe in serendipity and things happen because they're supposed to, uh, my, uh, one of my grandsons graduated with a master's degree in English from BU, <clears throat> and he didn't have a job yet. And I was telling him about this experience that I had the night before, and he said, well, then you should write the book, but we should do a graphic novel. And I was familiar with the genre because I had read Mouse and March. And um, I said, fine. So we went through the process. Uh, fortunately, he got a job. He's a teacher. So, and he soon was unable to do anything. But I told him that in order to do this properly, you had to choose people who could do it. I, was, I couldn't do it. And I knew Erminio for years. And he had been included in the Networks project that uh, was mentioned. And I, um, uh, we had lunch. And Erminio, I showed Bradley, my grandson, how you entice people to get involved in projects that they think they really want to do. Then they find out they're in it, and they have to do it. And Erminio took the hook 
And then he and I met a few times, <clears throat> but it was clear neither of us had the capability to do the next step, which Lenny, he found Lenny, who was a, a writer, to create the uh, story, which was a narrative that I had provided. Now, the good news, which really was bad news, was that COVID came along. And Herminio was very involved in the process and decided he was going to do everything. And if COVID had not occurred, he would have never done it. We wouldn't have had this event. We would still be talking about <laughs> trying to finish it. But since he had nothing else that he could do for a year or two, and he was basically in his house, he went through the process. And the purpose, and it's his genius that put together the, the graphic novel where we took advantage of my art collection of local artists, where we were able, he was able to find the art, which is all in the glossary of the book. So that's enough. The book is Chazen Unfiltered. It was going to be Chazen Never Enough. And just before <clears throat> we were going to press, Donald Trump's niece wrote a book, and I was not going to have anything to do with Never Enough. So, <laughs> so anyway, it's, that's the name of the company, the Never Enough Book Company. But that's enough. Erminio, tell them about your genius. Well, uh, I'm going to remember that phrase of taking the hook. That's exactly what I've done my whole life. I think that I've always been reeled in the projects because um, I mean, some people will say you bite off more than you can chew. But when you do that, you do learn to chew more than you did the last time. So uh, my entryway into the artistic practice that I work in, which is a mix of theater, physical um, performance, and three-dimensional construction and, and illustration, um, all were inspired by my exposure to the medium of drawings and pictures put together. You know, as a child, looking at comic books is the perfect storm. You know, you have an image that transports you that you could even imagine changing. You know, it brings out an editorial instinct in yourself as well to say, well, I'm reading this, but I pictured the building differently. Um, but I also was exposed to my first Ray Bradbury story, which was an adaptation of an old 50s comic book. Um, it was a reprint. Um, I wasn't a kid in the 50s, but I've also Edgar Allan Poe, indigenous of, you know, myths and folklore, uh, I'm a, a, even Shakespearean, you know, plots, which were used in comic books. And so it was something that I always dreamed I would be and do. Um, and it always was, but professionally, once I went to Rhode Island School, Rhode Island School of Design and um, got involved, I realized that um, I really wanted to work in, a, in kind of a place where the average person could stumble upon the work. So the gallery scene didn't attract me because I thought, if I'm successful, it's a small um, group of people and I have to work to expand that. Um, putting the work out in public or in a parade or at a carnival meant that everybody in the world could see it, but of course they could also walk by it and not engage with it. So it was a kind of an interesting footing to be between these two worlds, and that's why I pursued for many years doing theater, because it was everything. It was writing, drawing, picture making. Um, the hook that I bit for this project, though, drew me back to my dream. And so, uh, you know, when I... I when Lenny and I were sat there kind of once again in awe of uh, Dr. Chazen's accomplishments, we're like, oh yeah, he also did that. That could have been in the book. <laughs> I mean, that's what our process of making this book was like, how many things do we have to edit through to get, you know, just a little piece of his life on the page. Um, but I realized that the inspiration that I got, that when I bit this hook and got to do this graphic novel, it forced me to do something I'd never done but it brought me back to my training as an illustrator, and it made me want to do more of it now. So I'm in a, new, in a different place because of this journey. And, um, you know, I'm going to keep this short because there'll be Q&A and we'll be mingling, but I just wanted, I thought I'd segue now to just some images. I can talk over them. So, um, whoops. Okay, so here's just an example of, um, you know, just a, a picture which is, telling a story that on, on the printed page were, you know, like five lines or three lines. You know, Lenny's uh, 
idea. You know, they walk into a door, they greet these people, shake hands, and then walk out the door to another encounter. And as an illustrator, I had to think of how to make that magical realism. How, because in reality, the real experience probably felt that way, you know, going into a New York Soho uh, gallery and meeting artists and being exposed to this. So this is an example of how I kind of took it where you could read the book, you could read this any direction. Does, it's not sequentially specific. You could read it backwards, you could start at the bottom and read up. And it sort of, you know, was my way of being playful with the idea of what it's like to have an experience that inspires you. To walk into the world of art and things are happening all over you and you don't really experience it sequentially. Uh, there's also a lot of hidden symbolism in every page of the book because I wanted to keep myself from being bored. So if you really look at this, at the very top frame, you can see um, Joe and his wife, uh, and there's a, there's a bronze casting of a kidney, you know, which <laughs> never really happened, but that's a little <laughs> example of a hidden <laughs> element, okay? And, uh, and, the, and the yellow template I used a lot because of dialysis. You know, their urine is part of the... Uh, the process, and it's a, it, th that really informed me in a lot of my pages uh, to work with those, those tones, mm -hmm. as you can see once again. Uh, here's an example of like, you know, because Joe's commitment to so many artists, a lot of the book delves into either incorporating actual plates of fine art reproductions into the book, which I'll show you in a second, or actually drawing and repainting the artist's work. So in here, I'm painting the artists, and I'm painting and drawing their work. Uh, so I'm like this third version of the process. And the fact that it's in a book with, with uh, Joe as, a, as, as a Da Vinci's uh, you know, uh, <laughs> man there in the middle, Vesuvian man, uh, you know, is a, a playful way of, of playing. And also the yellow frames, you know, I'm, I'm, playing, I'm riffing off of the idea of an art collection. I, I went with the gold frame idea. So even every panel when it's yellow like this is playing off of the idea of the dialysis and the art collection. Anyway, there's a lot to read into it. Uh, here's an example where, you know, Joe is standing over a gallery opening at the RISD Chazen's Choice Award uh, uh, show that was just mentioned. And this is one of the many cases where I actually took those, those little miniature artworks in the gallery there are, um, you know, are real pieces in the collection that were shown that night. So here they are appearing in the gallery once again as a, you know, as a comic book uh, panel. Uh, for me, it's playful and subversive because you're taking the fine artists and you're turning their work into comic book panel. And I love that. I don't feel like it's bringing them down a level. I think it's really like saying, aren't we all at the same level? You know, aren't people who are working in different mediums? Okay, so I'm going to move onward. There we go. Um, Okay, and here's also just a chance to really take one of Joe's stories and run with it. He talked about a colleague who did experiments with toad bladders, and I just fought to get two pages devoted to the subject because it was, um, it was not a reprieve, it was just sort of a, a different direction to jump into for a second. So suddenly it became 50s pulp horror movie comic book. You know, there's a scared toad, his friend is being dissected. Uh, and then, of course, the toad gets its revenge at the end because Dr. Frankenstein is making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of playfulness. And, um, and then here's an example of where the book itself becomes a piece. As the, as the book went on, I tried to uh, move away from the conventional uh, panel structure and word balloons and get into just actually one-of-a-kind art pieces. So this is actually, if you take away the two narrative blocks, is just basically a collage. But the collage elements are all different little hidden parts of the book, of the pages that came before. So in a way, you know, I thought that this book could be something that a child might pick up or an inquisitive adult, and every time they looked at it, they'd say, oh, that isn't just a random image. That's the corner of the chair from page 20. So it's something that I think deserves a lot of rereading um, <laughs> because I had to look at it for so long. Um, I, I played with these little MacGuffins. <laughs> well, that's a whole other story. It was, a, it, was a, it was a delirium. So here's an example of just the process. I wanted to kind of tap into this and then I'll be done. Uh, this sketch is probably, the original is probably about three and a half inches by two inches or something. And, you know, I sketched on little dot paper. And that's where I was kind of working out, you know, taking Lenny's lines and trying to figure out how to make it something that's not just conventional box panels. Um, here's an example of that other panel I showed you in process where... It's just about the layering process. You know, I would sometimes work on this page, put it down, 
and then skip ahead to another page just to keep from going, you know, uh, getting obsessive uh, and getting too um, uh, focused on one on one page. And also, we were also doing rewrites, and Lenny would call me sometimes and go like, you know, are you you haven't inked that in yet, right? Because we just I talked to Miss Vay and we got this other idea, and you know, so there's a lot of uh, living and breathing in this process. Here's an example of a page construct where that's the page paste up. Here's the, the process. So a transparency drawn over a photocopied, you know, uh, a photocopy of a photo I took of Joe's dialysis center. And then I drew over where I could place Joe, and then this is the finished work. What I skipped were all the photos of me actually meticulously drawing each Joe and cutting it out with scissors, and then literally pasting it onto the page. So that is literally a collage. Um, so anyway, th that was just, um, you know, a little tease. There's 120 pages in the book, so I wasn't going to spoil anybody by showing many more. Um, but I would like to say before I hand it over to Lenny that um, the hook I took pulled me onto a boat, and uh, that boat traveled somewhere. <laughs> I got off. I mean, it was everything from the, tro the COVID pandemic intensity has subsided to a different form. The book is done, um, and now I'm like hungry to continue the work, and that's why I've now become the comics editor of the Motif page, so that I can work with and pull in other illustrators. And uh, the dream is to have a publishing scene in Providence that could be the awe of the rest of the nation, you know, where people can say, there's an aesthetic here, and the artists that you'll see in Joe's book, those fine artists, I'm hoping to get some of them to do some comic artwork in the graphic novel. Anyway, thank you for your time, and thank you for enjoying this. I'm enjoying it. First of all, thank you all for coming this evening very much. Um, how I got in into this process, uh, you might not be able to tell just by looking at me, but I'm into comic books. Um, very much so. <laughs> and uh, I very much love graphic novels, have read them since I was four years old. Uh, it's actually how I learned how to read, which says a lot. <laughs> um, but um, we, um, we, with this was, I love Spider-Man, I love Batman. And over time, I actually became enthralled with graphic novels that weren't superheroes. That was my entry point. I loved stuff that told real stories, um, that had stuff that has real things to say. There are books out there like Joe was talking about, um, Mouse, which was one. Um, but there's, uh, there's many, many, many other things in the comic book field, and many other ways, and many other ways to tell a story that you normally, you know, you wouldn't expect. And with that, I always loved to, f to seek these comic books out, these really independent uh, publishers. I love, and I, I do theater as well. And I, you know, back in when I was in college, I was reading about three plays a day because I wanted to write plays. And that's how you learn. You learn how, you know, by reading. And I put the graphic novels down for a little bit and I said, you know, I want to learn how to write and actually how to do these things. And I've always also been enthralled with biographical material. I love biographies. I love bi biographical movies. I love biograph. I love my, I don't even read like fiction books. I read nonfiction books. I love things. I don't drink wine, but I love reading about how to make wine. <laughs> I don't want to drink. I can't guarantee it'll be good. But, um, <laughs> but I, love, I love learning things. I love learning things through biography because I think that's, it tells us where we've been and where we're going. And um, when this opportunity came up, uh, you know, Joe didn't have to really, Dr. Chase didn't have to really like, in, you, know, you know, say, you know, give me any entry point really. I was, I was enthralled because it's a beautiful opportunity to do something that is just new. Um, something that we haven't seen in the graphic novel medium. We've seen, we've seen uh, things in a graphic novel medium, slice, slice of life, we've seen bio, you know, biographies, but most of the time those people aren't alive. Uh, and if they are, um, you know, you know, and if they are, there's, there's, something, there's something else going on that, that says this portion of their life is over. I don't think Joe's alive. I think Joe is continually doing things. Um, I think he's constantly moving forward. And I think the graphic novel became something that was, is, is another step in moving forward. It's such an amazing opportunity to say to, so, to, say to somebody, here, cr here's my life, here's all this, the, the, um, Here's all the stuff that we put into an interview. Now make something of it, and you can make anything with that. And part of my, but a part of my writing process was very much like Joe's process in getting things done um, with Arminio. I had to write things that would keep Arminio interested. That is, that is, you know, that it's a lot of it was. There were times we were talking the phone for three hours for one panel, for one scene. Uh, we took a month on, which is I think pages. 
uh, 81 through 83, I think. It was one, it's, the, it's the, the middle of the graphic novel there. I think we took like a, a month trying to get these things down. But everything was important to us. Everything became, became very, um, very much, very much uh, almost an obsession. Um, but every, every time I was writing something, I had to say, how is this going to keep Arminio interested? And how am I going to, because that's what you have to do when you have an artist who's going to spend a year of their life on it. And, um, you know, we, when I was doing it, a lot of times I'd be sitting there, how would I make them interested? I'd write one line and I get a phone call and says, what does this mean? And I'm like, that's for you to figure out, you know? <laughs> but, I, but he did, and he did it in a very ingenious way. Um, Joe talked about serendipity, and I think this whole process is all about serendipity. I think what we created was about serendipity. I think every moment of this graphic novel is something that, that comes from something else. Um, what's really great about it, and if you've, if you've read it, I, I thank you, but I, I recommend reading it and buying a copy tonight. Um, the greatest thing about this graphic novel is I still think it, in my opinion, just looking at it with all the things Arminio put into it and all the conversations we had, a lot of stuff in life is disposable. We watch movies. How many people here watch a movie and it's over and you forget even the title of it? You read a book, you kind of forget about what happened in it. You, you know, you, 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 you're people are consuming entertainment so quickly nowadays. Netflix, all these things. Arminio and I wanted to make a book and Joe said, here, make something, whatever you want to be. The biggest thing for us was to make something that lasts. And what I mean by, by lasting, and that it will last, outlive us even, even me and Arminio, if someone picks this book up in 40 years time, it will read as, as it does today. And that was very important to us. When, when we first released this book, like a soft release, it was 2020. And people were reading books back then, reading the book back then, and they were, they were enjoying it. And if you, people who are reading the book today, we, which you should pick up a copy, which is a promo, um, so, so please pick up a copy, you'll see that the people who read the book today, <coughs> that it, it still, still reads as well, if not better than it did in, 20, in 2020. If you read the book in 10 years, it's designed for that. That's what every moment of that is. That's the work that we put in, that Mark put in, uh, Emily, our editor, put in to make sure, and at Vicky, I want to thank Vicky because Vicky's the best editor I, I've ever worked with. Um, we made something that wanted to last, and we're still here at events two years later, and I hope there's more events. I would love to go to them because the, I think the book does have a shelf life that's beyond normal. Um, and I, I commend both Joe and Arminio especially, too, for putting in that extra work. Um, and that's basically it. I, I really am honored to even be a part of it. Um, you know, when you, when you get offered something like this, it's, you get it, when you get offered something that's just an opportunity to say, hey, create something, you create it, you jump into it feet, feet first, much like Joe did in 1970, uh, in the 1970s. And um, I implore you to pick up the book. Um, I thank you all. And um, that is it, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, we can do this, I guess. Uh, you know, like this. Um, what I mean is that it's kind of like if you watch a movie that still holds up. Um, that something that still holds up, like if you watch Hitch Hitchcock's Vertigo, to me that still holds up. Not to say this book is Vertigo, although that would be great. Um, you know, if we had something like that. But um, no, I, I, it's, it should still hold up in 10 years' time. There's, there's nothing that, that's in it that, it that isn't universal. What I have to say about the book too, and I, someone said this yesterday, is that you know we go into. Someone said this yesterday. And I like to just repeat this because it's in my head. Um, they said that when they go to, a, they worked at a restaurant. They got nothing but complaints. Um, but you know, then they started working in an ice cream sh uh, shop, and all they did was get you know people happy people. I think this book is kind of almost like ice cream in some regards. That everyone who reads it, it brings a smile to their face, yeah. and I, re I really do believe that. Yeah. I think also that it's, you know, it's a book that is um, also just an art piece, and it's also a gallery uh, mm -hmm. book, you know, so it has a, an index in the back and has all that artwork in it. It's got pages that are just art for art's sake, and then there's the story and the narrative. So I think maybe that's what is part of what Lenny is saying, yeah. is that it holds up because it's not just a today story, it's sort of also an object 
that lives uh, in time. Yeah. Um, well, another question? So it, this was a process, did, and it probably mostly directed to Joe, whose coat seems to match the wallpaper. Well, that's what I planned. <laughs> <laughs> it, did you learn anything about yourself, yourselves, I guess Joe in particular, but you, you two do it as well, in the process of making this piece of art? Well, I learned how important it is to pick the right people to do the job. And if you pick competent people, I mean, I worked with the same nurse for over 40 years. I had the same, I have the same barber for 60 years. You have to pick the right people. That's the genius. That's my superhero ability, to stimulate other people to create. I'm not, I don't create. Huh? Vinny, Vincenzo Carnavale. Yeah, who else? It's in the book. His first haircut as, uh, when he opened his own shop was my son, who was seven, who's now 62. So um, that's what I learned. I also learned that I'm very impatient. So the fact that it took longer than it was supposed to, in my mind, is my problem. And uh, although I've been accused of being um, short-tempered sometimes, I think it's, uh, I demand of others what I demand of myself. I don't know what you learned. I, I just learned that the barber didn't like the mustache I gave him. So uh, on that page, I drew everybody very realistically, but I didn't have a photo of, of his barber. So I just took the artistic liberty of drawing like what I thought was like the classic Italian barber with a giant handlebar mustache. <laughs> Did he, did he like the mustache or he didn't? He's happy. He's, He's okay. He complains a lot. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, swing for the fences is what I've learned um, in this process. A lot of times I was writing something, I think especially in the first set of pages I gave to, to Joe and Vicky and, and Minio, and, and I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, they're never going to, they're never going to you know, accept this. And uh, when they did, I was like, okay. This could be really great. And so, yeah, swing for the fe <laughs> An example is, I mean, like, I think three pages in, it depicts Joe and childhood friends peeing into Niagara Falls. So, I mean, you know, if, if you're okay with that, you can go forward with a lot of <laughs> edgy stuff. I think it was, it was real. yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, I'm lucky enough to have a signed copy of the book. And I have to say it's very amusing. And I, you know, you've captured a lot of the quirkiness of uh, Dr. Chase and um, I was wondering how you felt being portrayed as a superhero, and how did you um, create that quirkiness through your drawings and through the text? I, I don't know. You can be called anything, so. <laughs> so I had to find a reason why I was a superhero. Uh, but, to, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Well, you know, there was those pages where Joe won a series of legal accomplishments, which is pretty dry stuff because it's about committees and judgments and, and decisions being made. So, you know, we just took the artistic liberty of sort of having him turn into this hero who busts through these buildings and busts through the bureaucracy and is literally flying in a, in a Joe Chazen-like symbol shirt. So it, it just happens in a very short part of the book. But it's oh, I had to make sure I had to make sure that I was a straight man uh, when I'm doing the writing a lot of times too because I don't Arminio is very fantastical which is great but you want to make sure that even if it's portrayed as a superhero you want to make sure something is grounded in reality um, otherwise we lose the reader and the story we're trying to tell. Right. But the second part of your question oh. again was. Um, but you captured his quirkiness. Yes. And so quirkiness. what was. <laughs> um, what are the kind of visual um, tactics you took to be able to create that? I think we saw some of that with the, right. uh, with the frog. Yes, yes. And the kidney, the golden, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I thought those were. I think, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's the rules of show business. You know, you want to have, uh, it's like a vaudeville show. Or what is the old saying? If you don't like what you see now, just wait two minutes, you know, and then the hook comes out and then the, then the tap dancer comes out or something else happens. So the, the idea of each page turn had to have something that, I mean, there's some very serious pages, you know, there's, there's, and there's also topics that are very, um, you know, I, I, I think we were talking about the, uh, 
you know, the, the Birmingham church bombing yeah, pages was a very delicate uh, series of three pages to deal with. Uh, but, you know, you need to feel like after a page or two, there's going to be something that's quirky, something that changes the narrative device. That's why there's an invented, like, little narrative frog who's supposedly a sculpture that came to life. I mean, there's a lot of liberties taken. I guess it's like magical realism, you know, is the idea. Yeah. So it kept it interesting, but it also worked for theater. <laughs> so I guess what I hadn't thought about was um, when I, because my profession is a physician, <laughs> when I decided that it was necessary to provide the service of dialysis, which was in its absolute infancy, if not even neo neonative state, um, the bureaucracy was very rigid. It's Rhode Island, change, expense, um, all of the things that went on then. <clears throat> but I was young, and I really didn't think that I could not accomplish it. So the people that I've also chosen were people who I would tell them, I don't want to hear why we can't do it. No is not in the, in the vocabulary, but how can we do it? And uh, my experience with the bureaucracy was interesting <laughs> and challenging. So <clears throat> I was interested in learning how you came up with the format. I mean, who decided you know, the flow of the story and, 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 and you know, were your words I just had it all go together. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to pass it to Lenny, but I know uh, that it started with a series of interviews that Bradley did with you. Yeah, I did right. uh, two, br two interviews with my grandson before he got a job, <laughs> in which I was able to just tell him a story, my life, my business with the art, uh, the, um, the dialysis story, and he was able to take the verbal story and through the magic of uh, cybernetics, get it written. So we had a significant uh, book that was written without editing. It was just the story that Lenny uh, changed into uh, verbiage. Yeah, the the thing of it was for me, and I, he's right. Bradley had that had the the interviews. Um, I wanted to do something that was nonlinear. Some that started off nonlinear, but it feels like it's linear because, you know, I, I think with a story like, you know, something that someone like Dr. Chazen, he, you know, he has a very, a very, um, a very colorful life. So I wanted to make sure that if we told the story from beginning to end, it would just be like, OK, you know, but what was what would be better than that is telling something that's nonlinear, something that does jump in time a bit. Some, you know, because, again, it's a memory book, so we don't remember things in particular in the same order. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, we that not only, you know, we can tell the story from, the, you know, from this point to this point to where he's over here, go back and forth in time, but also make sure that the reader could follow it. And a lot of that became something talking to Arminio, because I, I do consider, you know, Arminio, you know, basically a co-writer, because they are. Uh, anyone, who, anyone who draws a script is a co-writer, no matter what, because they're always making choices on the page, to make sure he had enough to say in, in our conversations to go, I want to do something that, I, wa I want to make sure that this works and it flows, so it do nobody gets lost. We included him. Yeah. yeah. He was, uh, what is he going to tell me? He doesn't like it? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, I think he's pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Was he surprised to see it happen? Well, he liked the frog. That was her mini. That's such a big deal. There were some other issues we didn't include. You know, he was, yeah, he's, and he just got married. So he's really happy about other things. <laughs> yeah, and you know he also appears in the book. He's like he and the frog are kind of like this weird, little like friends. You know, it's there, and he's like an Archie comic figure, and he's a bit more cartoony than anyone else in this book. So he he factors in. Jill, hi. Um, so I have a question. I know that this book is obviously based on Dr. Chasen's recollections, but there are so many artists that Dr. Chasen has sponsored or, you know, really helped people um, 
make names for themselves, expose them, you know, to other people and, and whatnot. Did you interview any of the artists um, to get their recollection? No, we didn't. We didn't do that. No, yeah. would have been amazing. That, that's that wasn't the purpose. <laughs> And I, I'm not sure I did all those things. I think the artists have the, their own capabilities, and they succeeded because they're so good at what they do. I chose only the ones I like. Yeah. If I didn't like them, they're not included anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. But I think you did what you faced as a doctor. You allowed artists to cut through some of that red tape. To them yeah, well, I did relate to that, and I, uh, when I was uh, in the process of getting permissions, I was always impressed with how the artists work, usually alone in a studio, uh, trying to develop new techniques, uh, and then one day have a show to find out that nobody liked it. So uh, I was never looking for when I was trying to accomplish the, the clinics, I wasn't looking for self-gratification. I was looking to accomplish what I had in mind. And I think artists are similar. Do you have something to add to the subject? Yeah. You know, in a couple of the pages, the artworks that were chosen, they appear in the background of this fictional office where Joe is speaking with Bradley, his grandson. And you'll notice that the painting's constantly changing. It's always the next panel, there's a different piece of artwork in the same scene. And I kind of picked pieces from Joe's collection that I thought felt like the mood. So in a particularly so, sort of sullen part of the book, there's some stark landscapes and solitary figures and you know a lonely bird in the sky. And it's my hope that the artist is speaking through that moment. You know, they're given the stage on the page where their artwork can be looked at in juxtaposition to another story. And uh, so in that way, I think it would have been a monumental other book to interview all those artists. And then you have like, who do you pick and who don't you? And you know, why wasn't I interviewed as well? So it's a huge thing, but. I wasn't gonna interview any of them. <laughs> so, so it was just would have been it would have been a never ending uh, never ending deep dive. We would still be. Uh, I didn't actually want. I wanted to add. I didn't actually want to meet Bradley until the script was done either. Um, not because, uh, and I think he understood that. And I actually really like Bradley a lot, and we've gotten along very well. Uh, and he's helped he helped me out very much until the script was done, because he can tell you this as a writer, and I felt he would the same thing if he had written the book. He wouldn't want me sitting around and being like, okay, this is what I would do. And I think he felt the same way, which was really nice of him. And he understood that. Um, but afterwards, after the book was done, you know, we talked on the phone, I think, for like an hour. And it was, it was all good things. It was, it was great. Apparently, yeah. Lenny times his phone conversation. I do. I do. Spoke for three hours. Was it? I, every <laughs> single one. I am. <laughs> 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 Maybe, maybe, if it's not too late. <laughs> well, that's before I thank our speakers, of course, this is the perfect moment to invite you all to uh, food and wine and more conversation with our uh, presenters. Uh, this was really great. And it showed the three of you just chatting with each other and presenting one after the other, but sticking to your time. The whole thing was showed what great collaborators you've become in that process, right? And well, thank you more than once. <laughs> and you know, one could Virtual. imagine a better way of, of uh, celebrating Dr. Jason's super heroic efforts on behalf of Rhode Island artists in many different ways that we all know. Well, I would tell know. everybody has a story, That's and true. it can be as interesting as the person you get to explain or write the story. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage all of you to do books. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real work of art, obviously, and celebrates uh, not just Dr. Chase's work, but also two great Rhode Island artists, right. Big Nazo, so to speak, Arminio and Lenny and Dr. Chase. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.